Football player Hakeem Al Arabi was detained by Thai authorities at Bangkok Airport because they had been notified by the Bahraini government that he was on their wanted list for anti-government. Seeing protests. Hakeem come out of that van in shackles, it was really emotional. You'd have to be carved out of stone to not have felt the gravity of, of that situation and how dire it really was. He had four or five guards around him and he was barefoot, which is poignant because the kid's a footballer. And he's shackled and the whole place just erupted. He was very, very scared, very frightened, very distressed. It was the most visceral, confronting thing I'd ever seen in my life. I was just yelling at him, trying to give him some heart, trying to give him some hope. Your wife sends her love, Hakeem. All of Australia is with you. Be strong, buddy. I heard Craig Foster, he told me, just Hakeem, stay strong. Stay strong. He gave me hope. Australia's with you, Hakeem. With Craig Foster, here you have a guy, an ex soccero captain, media broadcaster, that puts his life on hold, essentially, for someone who he's never met. Football is with you, good man. Craig Foster went in boots and all. And I think that's, you know, it's someone that's got a reputation like him. I think that's pretty, pretty gutsy. He's a footballer, uh, he's a refugee, and he simply should be let go. We have this joke around here that he's like the bionic man because he will just continue to go and go and go. Hey! Hey! If you were to go to war tomorrow, I'll tell you now that you will want Craig Foster fighting for you and with you. Because nobody will stop fighting until they get what they want, like Foz will. I always say to Craig, you have a broken wing syndrome. You always want to fix everyone's problems. And there is something that motivates him when someone's broken. You know, when you play for Australia, you don't do it alone. You know, you don't get in the backyard and, and grow up, play, and, and just end up in the Socceroos. You get immense amount of support and help. And there's people in our community always who need that help. I grew up in Lismore, northern New South Wales. I started playing football when I was four at the Ganella Bar Soccer Club, the Mighty Hornets, they're called. When he was growing up, he had a very strong character. Black is black and white is white. He had his own ideas and he stuck to them. And Craig likes to lead. When he was playing soccer, you could hear his voice on, on the pitch the whole time directing traffic. One youngster from Lismore in New South Wales covered himself with glory by being named in a composite world youth team. No one could believe that this team came from some unknown soccer nation called Australia. I think he had probably two sporting goals and one was to play in the, in the highest league possible, the English Premier League, and he was very proud to play for his country and he ticked both those boxes. You wouldn't say that he was blessed with a lot of natural ability, but he was extremely hardworking uh, and determined. And I think that helped him a lot on a way to uh, not only becoming a soccerer, but going on to Captain Australia. It's gone in! A third goal for Australia, and a deserved goal to Craig Foster. If he tries to play pragmatically against Barca, I'll, get, I'll put money there that Barca will win the league. After retirement, Craig immediately started to work for SBS and he just took to it like ducks of water. And no one wants to go home in this crowd right now, Les. You see, even the Croatians are singing. When Craig joined Les Murray at SBS, they formed a really close bond. Right, Foz, relax, have a beer, and I'll join you in a moment. Les was in his 60s, was a Hungarian refugee, so we were like two worlds apart. And that's the beauty of sport 
but it's most certainly the beauty of football because that's multicultural. That's bringing everyone together. Les was almost universally adored by football fans, whereas Craig could be a more polarising figure. I'm just oh, going so on not, your results, right? I'm not attacking you personally. Okay. I'm I know saying... you are. Okay, you're not attacking me personally. That's great. I feel much better because you're a really close mate. He's not in it for a popularity contest. So, you know, he has... People love him or hate him, either way. To be perfectly honest with you, I would have walked down after the game and sacked him, right, because it's not good enough. There's a certain zealotry to the way he goes about things, whether it's his media work, his advocacy for the game, his work within the players' union. But when it came to a young man being detained in Thailand, as Hakeem was, I think that zealotry, that cut through, that passion, was really what was needed at the time. Hakeem Al-Arabi is a young Bahraini man. He loved playing football. Uh, he started his career early in youth national teams in Bahrain and worked his way up. I have a big family in Bahrain. All of them play uh, football, um, but I am the best of them. <laughs> I was goalkeeper actually in Bahrain, and I was fast. Bahrain is a small kingdom near Saudi Arabia. It is ruled by the, by the Bahraini royal family. So it's some kind of dictatorship. In 2011, the Arab Spring hit Bahrain and there were mass protests right around the country. Uh, everyday citizens coming out onto the streets uh, asking for democracy. <laughs> Hakeem naturally, uh, as a young person in Bahrain, could see that and was caught up in that. Being a well-known athlete and the notoriety that that brings made him a target with the government. He was accused of being part of a group that allegedly uh, burnt down a police station, despite the fact that he was playing on television at that very time in a football match for his professional club. He was arrested and tortured. And he talks about being beaten on the legs, which are common stories across a range of athletes because over 150 of them were incarcerated at that time. He started to beat me. He uh, put something in my eyes. I don't know why. I didn't do any crimes. Uh, the five policemen, when they tortured me, they say, Hakim, I, we know you. You will never play football again. The president of the Asian Football Confederation, Sheikh Salman, was the president of the Bahrain Football Federation at the time. And of course, he's a member of the monarchy. And when these footballers were incarcerated, Salman said nothing and did nothing on their behalf. If your first job is not to protect your players, protect your athletes, then I don't know what is. When I received that message, I started crying because I was just 20 years old when I was in Qatar, and I don't know which country now I, I have to go. He uh, feared being imprisoned or worse. He left to Iran and made his way eventually to Australia, where he arrived in mid-2014. He was able to then apply for his protection visa, which, as we know, is a very stringent process and, in the end, was granted by the Australian government. When we heard that Sheikh Salman was a candidate to become the president of FIFA, we were very concerned. And when I say we, I mean the Sport and Rights Alliance, the whole sport and human rights movement. I'm honoured if, if people think that, you know, I'm a favourite. Hakim bravely, incredibly bravely, spoke out and told the world what had happened 
and how Salman said nothing, did nothing. Sie haben mir drei Stunden hart auf die Beine geschlagen. Gesagt, wir werden dir die Knochen brechen. Wir werden deine Zukunft zerstören. I talked to the, the media. I don't support Sheikh Salman because Sheikh Salman he didn't help me when I was in Bahrain. When you say tortured, I think allegedly tortured. I don't think there were any players who are tortured. And it's overwhelmingly likely that because Hakim spoke out, Salman lost the FIFA presidential race. Sheikh Salman from Bahrain came in second. This is why I think the main reason Thailand arrested me because I talk about Sheikh Salman in 2016. Season 2018, Pascal Football Club were looking for a, a defender and Hakim became available. Hakim was a very, very competent, solid defender. Exactly what we needed at the time. And when we did sign him, it was probably one of our most successful seasons we've ever had. I really enjoy being with basketball. We were fourth in the tables. But it's really a very nice day. We just saw Hakim as the person he was. Little did we know that his past will come back to him the way it did, you know? Hakim was granted uh, protection by Australia, so that means that he was a recognised refugee and he was also uh, able to apply for a uh, United Nations uh, passport, essentially, that would allow him to travel internationally from Australia. His girlfriend, now wife, had joined him. They decided in 2018 to go on honeymoon together to Thailand. I call many times to the Australian migration to ask them, am I allowed to travel outside to Australia because I have a case in Bahrain? They told me, yes, everything will be fine. On the 27th of November, he and his wife turn up to Melbourne International Airport to travel to Bangkok and an alert went off that there was an active Interpol Red Notice on Hakeem. An Interpol Red Notice is much like a, an electronic wanted poster. It's a, a call for a government to locate an individual that is uh, accused of a crime and, um, and essentially provisionally arrest them. He told me, just wait here. I waited for 10 minutes and he, he called someone. The immigration official made a phone call to the Australian Federal Police asking if there was any lawful reason to prevent Hakeem from travelling that day. They were told no, uh, so the uh, immigration official hung up the phone and allowed Hakeem to catch his flight. We know that the uh, Australian Federal Police Interpol contact point uh, notified Thailand that he was travelling, what flight he would be on, uh, and they also notified Bahrain. When Hakim stepped onto the plane, he had no idea that there was a red notice on him. So it obviously would have been a hell of a shock to arrive on the tarmac in Bangkok when all of the immigration police detained both he and his wife. I say I have asylum seeker in Australia and Bahrain they won't, kill, they won't kill me. I was very scared in that time. And my wife, she's too. I'm in the detention in Bangkok for two days. Uh, I just want an Australia help me to walk to me to Australia again. I don't want to walk to, to Bahrain because it's very dangerous in Bahrain. On that Thursday morning, we got a message and we saw that Hakim had been detained. His wife had done a, a video and he's, he said, I'm, I'm detained in, in 
um, Thailand and Bahrain wants to kill me. We just thought it's one of our players and we needed to help this kid get back. So we shared that video. Um, this is my bed. Our initial goal was just to get the word out as quick as we possibly could. I don't actually recall specifically who contacted me about Hakeem, but I knew that I had a responsibility as an ex-player. I was a refugee ambassador with Amnesty, and I could see that it, there, was, there was no coordination. I'd never run a campaign before, so I was making it up as I went along. Getting key big names in sport and other fields was, I thought, critically important. I don't want to box to Bahrain. I want to box to Bahrain. I didn't do anything in Bahrain. I'm refugee. When I saw this campaign that was in its very early stages start to develop, um, I was very quickly to offer any assistance I could. Craig was getting up at 5 in the morning, and he wasn't going to bed till 11, 12 at night. And he's like, what's FFA doing? You guys need to do this. Who's speaking to the Premier? I mean, he had me sending out tweets to Scott Morrison. So, you know, uh, <laughs> that's, you know, whether Scott Morrison read them or not, I don't know. Hakeem's wife has consistently requested um, that, she, that her identity remain anonymous. Uh, she's worried about consequences for her family. I first met her a few weeks after I got involved. She just said very directly to me, are you going to save my husband? <laughs> and um, You know, I, I, I won't forget that moment. I said, well, I'm doing my best. You know, I'm, I'm doing this and that, and I'm certainly going to try. And she wasn't taking try for an answer. <laughs> Today, the Australian Foreign Minister flew to Thailand for a face-to-face -face meeting with her counterpart. The Thai government is uh, most certainly aware of the importance of this matter to Australia. The relationship between Thailand and Bahrain, there is a kind of emotional relationship between them, as well as there is some uh, economic ties. Thailand didn't want to damage that ties and this relationship. A message from the harbour city to the self-proclaimed land of smiles. There's no reason for Hakeem to be incarcerated in Thailand. Yeah, I was right very now. worried when Craig told me he was going to Bangkok. Sheikh Salman is obligated to support Hakeem. He was dealing with some large and powerful groups, and I was pretty sure that those groups weren't going to like what he was saying. On three separate occasions, we had some suspicious events happen in our street. We actually had people watching our house, which was a, a little alarming. That was a moment of pause, but we were so committed that it was never going to stop us. A man on a mission, former Socceroo Craig Foster arrives in Bangkok not to play or commentate, but to fight for the freedom of a fellow footballer. I've been uh, in the prison more than 60 days. The prison was very tight, around 50 persons in the same room. I have no contact with my wife in that time. I was every day crying until when Craig Foster visited me. When I went to see him in prison, you see a kid who is just, he's where a human being should never be. He's in a position where he doesn't know whether the next day he is going to be tortured or possibly killed. He doesn't know if he's ever gonna see his new wife again. And it was a kid who I uh, was so desperate. When I finish a uh, visit time, I smile because I feel the people outside, they uh, help me. 
The former Socceroo emerged choking back tears. I told him that the players of the world are fighting hard for him. Um, and I said, I believe we're going to win the battle. Bahrain has formally applied to extradite Hakim al Arabi, the Melbourne-based refugee and soccer player who's been held in a Thailand prison for two months. Bahrain have submitted their extradition paperwork. They were trying to force it through with the Thai government. And that's when I decided that I had to gate crash FIFA. FIFA, the world governing body of football, weren't doing enough. You don't just rock up to FIFA and demand to see the Secretary General. That doesn't happen. Unprecedented. And Foz said, I'm doing it. From the heat of Bangkok to the, the freezing temperatures uh, in Zurich. And, and, you know, the humour in it was that he wore the same suit the whole time. We're, we're seeing Fatma Samura at midday at 12 o'clock. Foz then demanded an audience with the General Secretary. He said, you either meet me or I'm meeting out here with the world's media. Very nice, my first time here actually. Really? Yes. yes. No, you've yeah. never invited me. And it was just sheer force of will that made it happen, nothing else. Bahrain are winning, is what he said to me. He knows the, the regime very well, obviously, having been tortured previously. When we went to FIFA, the most important thing was to get the FIFA at the highest level to accept that we now had an emergency. It's clear that uh, the situation has escalated. So it went back and forth, this and that, and, oh, no, we can't do that. I know that we agreed on that, but we could only say this. Anyway, in the end, they started turning the lights off and the cleaners came in at Fever House. And we were sitting in half darkness. And eventually we ended up agreeing to a joint press release. To escalate the issue to the highest levels of both countries. FIFA agreed that this was now an emergency situation and we were able to get an elevated uh, diplomatic effort on FIFA's behalf. At that moment, I knew we had struck back at Bahrain in a way that they could never have anticipated or actually believed could be possible. This is about showing the rest of the world today how much Australia cares and it's about... And the more we delved into the relationship between Thailand and Bahrain, we were very fearful, you know, that are we poking, are we poking the bear too much here? Do we, you know, are we doing this, uh, you know, is this going to have the adverse effect? It just struck me that the harder we were going, the faster they were responding. When he went back for the second trip to Bangkok, he realised that Hakim was in really serious trouble. There's been some chatter back in Australia that, uh, you know, Thailand could, for instance, just extradite him today. So we're really extremely nervous and concerned. An extradition hearing for refugee footballer Hakim Al Arabi has The been moment changed. where Hakim appeared out of the prison bus, not only with his ankle shackle but also in bare feet, was the turning point of the campaign without a doubt. The uh, social media traction and the traditional media traction skyrocketed. I think it was the first time that Hakeem's humanity really shone through. He was no longer a Muslim male refugee. He was obviously in a state of disorientation and distress, and people saw that and reacted to it, including our own Prime Minister. The Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, has written to his Thai counterpart, expressing his shock at seeing the detained footballer, Hakeem al Arabi in leg irons. It is within the executive authority of the Thai government to actually enable him, under their law, to be returned to Australia. What the shackles did was they brought the world down on uh, Thailand. Pressure is mounting on the government to release a football player who is being held on an extradition request from Bahrain. He holds refugee status in Australia. Save Hakeem, the hashtag was, was, was trending worldwide, uh, and Craig Foster was at the core of that. We'll take you to Canberra where the Prime Minister... The Australian government was going extremely hard. Our embassy was brilliant. Maurice Payne was unbelievable. We are asking Prime Minister... So all of that created the conditions, in my opinion, which allowed a solution to be negotiated.
It was a Monday, the 11th of February, 2019. <laughs> and we were, we were told that Thailand were going to let him come home and that Bahrain had in fact withdrawn the extradition order. But it was just a, an absolute sense of just uh, emotional and physical collapse. Uh, and I just could have slept for a week. The Thai foreign minister had conversations at the highest levels with the Bahraini royal family directly before uh, the decision was made to release Hakeem. And in breaking news, refugee footballer Hakeem Al Arabi will be sent back to Australia tonight. I was just waiting for this day. They take me from prison to the airport. When the plan landed, I really feel I'm safe. To see Hakeem and Foz come together in that moment is something that I'll never forget. It was this culmination of one guy's, you know, tragedy and another guy's inspiration. It really was a special day for my life. On Craig Foster, he was there. When I saw him, I hugged him. Of not Craig Foster, maybe I'm still in Thai prison or maybe uh, in Bahrain. I just want to thanks to Australia and this amazing to see all the people here, all the Australia people, all the media, they support me. I want to thank this man, his fight. Um, sorry. Good on you, A young Australian reunited with his wife. That's the most important thing here. It all paid off and we were just so happy for Hakeem and his wife that they could uh, start their life again. The newest Australian, but someone whose Australian values have always been deep in his heart. In my life, I want to do something special for Australia. They uh, give me a lot of things. Now it is my time to do something special to the Australia. I am a different person for the after when I mm. back to, from Thailand. Mm. The thing the that most surprised me after he got back was a really strong sense of guilt because the next day I had a whole avalanche of emails and messages and things from people who were also in trouble. I got to speak. Asylum seekers who were in detention and somehow got a message to me. So I am lending my voice wherever possible. I was asked to go and speak at the UN around the ability of sport to uh, bring positive change in the world, something that I believe in really strongly. Oh, I'm excited to see, um, see the UNGA. Our voice and positive support in sport is critical to achieving the global progress we need to see. He has an interest in and has the ability to really change the conversation uh, on refugees and immigration issues here in Australia. Actually, I'll be honest with you, uh, this, my love is hard. I'm still, still scared about my government in Bahrain. Thank you very much. Hakeem stands as proof today of the power of all of us. That's what you and I, what we can do together. That's people power. <laughs> Community is about caring for each other and compassion. And a nation is only a big community. It's critical for people to know that they can influence the world around us. I learned that during the campaign, that we are much more powerful than what we imagine, particularly when we're united as a collective force. 17 years, it's a lot, huh? Yeah. But you still feel like it's the same, you know? You still feel like you can play for Pascoe Vale.